Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, on this blessed Sunday, make us worthy to praise your resurrection with pure hearts and with clear consciences. With all the children of your holy church, we glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Raise glory, honor, and praise to the good and merciful Lord, who in his compassion came down to us and became flesh. He chose to taste death to save us, and he descended to the realm of the dead. By his resurrection he gave joy to his disciples and gave light to the nations with the light of his salvation. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. O oh, Word of God, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion, and what voice can bless you, for you are above all praise. Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Now, O Christ our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense which we offer you to forgive our sins, give peace of mind to those in distress, and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far and watch over those who are near. Guide the shepherd, sanctify the priest, and purify the deacons. Pardon all sinners and guard the righteous, protect orphans and help widows. Drive away all conflicts <coughs> and put an end to all dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom, that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. We raise glory to you, to your blessed Father, and to your living Holy Spirit now and forever. Oh, Lord. 
Lord, receive the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with the angels, to proclaim it along with your women disciples and to rejoice in its pure victory with your apostles. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Spirit of holiness now and forever. Amen. with joy from the mountain. Sunday is a feast so great. Offer praise to the Lord God and with angels celebrate. St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, hence now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. For what the law weakened by the flesh was powerless to do, this God has done. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for the sake of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteous decree of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who lives not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit? For those who live according to the flesh are concerned with the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit with the things of the spirit. The concern of the flesh is death, but the concern of the spirit is life and peace. For the concern of the flesh is hostility towards God. It does not submit to the law of God, nor can it. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit. If only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. 
if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint Matthew who proclaimed life unto the world let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls The Apostle Matthew writes, But the Pharisees went out, and they took counsel against Jesus in order to put him to death. And when Jesus realized this, he withdrew from that place. And many people followed him, and he cured them all, but he warned them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I delight. I shall place my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not contend or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings forth the justice unto victory. And in his name, the Gentiles shall hope. This is the truth, peace be with you. name the nations shall hope. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. So the Pharisees are not de demonic. We get used to telling this story, like we tell the story of Judas, and hopefully over these last years when we've thought about what Judas actually does do, he's also not demonic. So what do the Pharisees do in being not evil? They're not malicious, they're not evil, but they do evil things. 
So notice we've pointed out oftentimes when you look at the anaphoras and we talk about after the words of institution of our Lord's second coming that we wait for, in which he will judge everyone according to his deeds, the things that we have actually done. In fact, St. Thomas More even goes farther than that. He says on the day of judgment, we shall not be judged so much as what we have done, but as what we were meant to have done. What it is it in God's plan that he actually intends for us to do in our lives? <clears throat> it is also the reason why we have the axiom that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. What the Pharisees do is very understandable. Their actions, what they result in, are very evil and ultimately will wind up in our Lord's death. We know this. And when the gospel begins today by saying that they go out and they take counsel with one another to put him to death, we're only in chapter 12. There's another 16 chapters. More than half of this gospel is about the clash between the people of Israel and our Lord. So we can ask the question, why? If they're not demonic, and their intention is good, not to be malicious, then what are they doing? They're doing what we all do. We live in illusions. We make false judgments. We often make rash judgments. And then our actions follow suit. So the actions become evil and sin is brought forth. But it's because we're distorted already in the first part. It's completely opposite of the idea in the modern world where everyone just says, well, you know, her intentions were good. And that may be fine. But so were the Pharisees' intentions good as far as they were concerned. That is not morality. That's part of morality, but it's not all of morality. That's why we can say that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. When we look at this gospel today in chapter 12, <clears throat> A few weeks ago, if you recall, we looked at chapter 10, sending out the disciples two by two to prepare for our Lord's coming into the villages around the area of Galilee. And we had said that before that, chapter 9 was all about healings. And then chapters 5, 6, and 7, 8 and 9 are about healings. 5, 6, and 7 are the famous Sermon on the Mount in which our Lord lays out, excuse me, <coughs> our Lord lays out really the vision of what is the kingdom of God. And it's shocking to them. It's shocking to them because it looks like he's overturning the law of Moses to the point where he has to say and does say explicitly, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, to bring it to its perfection. So when we take this gospel today, we have a quotation of Isaiah. It's a very simple text. The Pharisees come together. They plot to kill our Lord. So our Lord leads that place. People follow him. He heals them. But he tells them, do not speak about this. Do not reveal me. Part of that is to avoid further conflict with the Pharisees. He knows they don't understand. He knows the hearts of men. So the gospel is very simple, and it says that in order to fulfill this prophecy of Isaiah, and then you have this long quotation. The long quotation that is there is actually from chapter 42 of the prophet Isaiah. It is the second of what are known as the songs of the servants of Yahweh, the Ebed Yahweh, the slave literally, the slave of the Lord. So the book of Isaiah is enormously long. It's over 60 chapters. It's quite beautiful. If you've never read it, I highly encourage you to read it. It's beautiful. It's filled with consolation. It's also filled with chastisement and justice, but it is also filled primarily with consolation. It ends that way. But in it, you have a number of what we call these canticles or these songs of the servant of the Lord, of the Ebed Yahweh, of the slave of Yahweh. And they are portrayals of who the Messiah is to the point where, where the fathers of the church say that Isaiah is the fifth evangelist. 
He writes the gospel so clearly of his punishment, of his betrayal, of his rejection, and that by his death, by his punishment, that we are healed and raised up. So this is from the second of these songs of the servant of the Lord. And you'll notice that what's being portrayed there is that the coming of the servant of the Lord, the servant of the Lord is not going to be shouting in the streets. He's not going to be fighting, but he will be teaching and he will be clarifying. And that's where you have the famous text that he will not squelch the smoldering ember. He's not going to come up to the campfire and when the embers are all burnt down, but there's still a little bit going and then drop a log on it and knock out the entire fire. This is the image that's being given. There's more to the canticle than that, but St. Matthew is quoting to, quoting to the Christians in this gospel to say, when he says, don't reveal him, he's saying this is a fulfillment of who the very servant of the Lord is, who is the Messiah, is Jesus of Nazareth. And so he quotes this text from Isaiah of the clarity that he will bring forth justice unto victory. This is triumph. But the triumph will be in a pathway which will not break. And so his conflict with the Pharisees is the Pharisees' misunderstanding with all the best intentions of the world. But to avoid the conflict because the purpose is not the conflict, the purpose is the teaching. They don't understand, there's no reason to fight over it because they're actually not fighting over the same thing. When we live in an illusion, and when we make rash judgments, what is in our head of the situation is different from what the other people see. And so what our Lord is trying to accomplish here and what the Pharisees see him doing in their minds are completely two different things. There's no reason to fight over this, but there is reason to bring further clarity and further teaching and further lessons. So this little tiny text is really quite rich because it's surrounded by two miracles, two miracles with lessons. Now at the beginning of this gospel today, it says that after this, the Pharisees get together and they start the plot. So what's the after this? Well, the after this at the end of chapter 11 is the question of what can you do on the Shabbat? What can you do on the Sabbath? And the Pharisees and the doctors of the law, being zealous for the law of Moses, gave many prescriptions of what it means that you cannot work on the Lord's day. What is work? So you have to ask the question, what defines work? So they're doing this not to make rules. They're doing this to clarify the law of God, which is the working. And they gave, they came up with a list that was generally agreed upon of 39 different things that could not be done on Saturday. When I was in New York City, or New York, when I worked in Long Island, I had many parishioners that had grown up in Brooklyn. And one of the gentlemen there, he told me about when he was younger, he was a Shabbat boy. Now, coming from Detroit, I didn't know what a Shabbat boy was. But the Shabbat goy would be you Gentiles in the neighborhood that the Orthodox Jews would pay to come in and do things like turning on and turn off the lights. Because originally you would have had to make a fire. And so at the time of our Lord, the making of a fire is considered work. You have to put all your kindling together. You've got to bring wood in. You have to start making with your flint. You have to do all these things. So it was considered as one of the works. So they've continued with this idea, you can't illuminate or make light. And so this 12, when his man was 12 years old, he was a Shabbat Goy. He'd go over to his Jewish neighborhood, to his Jewish neighbors, they'd give him, I don't know what, a quarter or something, and he would go around and turn lights on for them or turn them off so that they would, that they would obey the law. And who cares about the pagan Gentile? And so you had 39 different rules. And one of them was you could not practice medicine. Think of surgery. Think of surgery with no anesthesia. Right. So medicine could not be practiced either. 
And so what is the episode that takes place just before this is our Lord is in the synagogue. And there is a man in the synagogue who has a paralyzed arm, a withered up arm. And it's the men in the synagogue who ask the young rabbi from Nazareth. They provoke the question, can someone heal on the Sabbath? Because of course, if he says yes, then he's violating the interpretation of the law of Moses to work on the Sabbath. If he says no, then all of his things about lessons about compassion and mercy all go out the window. So it's a trap and it's meant to be a provocation. And so what our Lord does is he gives lessons, he teaches. By comparing what you would do as a good Jew on the day and have one of your sheep fall into a pit, into a hole. And everyone knew that you could on that, even the Sabbath day, you could take the sheep out of the hole. That's work, you gotta climb down, you have to get your rope, you have to do all these things, bring this animal out. And so what our Lord clarifies for the Jews is, this man is worth much more than a sheep. And you can always do good on the Sabbath. And so he calls the man forward at the synagogue and he heals his arm. This is the thing that then the Pharisees after come together to plot against our Lord. To put him to death because what he does is considered capitally a capital crime in violating the Sabbath, the very Sabbath of the Lord. Now does that make them demonic? No. That's why we began the sermon this way. Does it make them misunderstanding and ignorant? To some degree, yes. They certainly misunderstand. But this is a lesson for all of us. Because we all have expectations about how God is supposed to work. And God is always teaching us, always. Whether we're five years old or whether we're 105, God is always instructing and in teaching us. And we don't really like necessarily being taught this is why so many people will rebel against what they call religion. But it's just God, ultimately. I don't like this and I don't like that. And it shouldn't go this way and it shouldn't go that way. And so I'll just give it all up or be in opposition to it or just distract myself and go to camp. It'll be easier. This is what leads the foundation for the desire of the Pharisees to kill our Lord, that the man was healed. And immediately after the gospel that we have today, we're told people bring to our Lord a man who's deaf and mute, he stutters. So clearly it seems that he probably heard at one time in his life. And so when you meet those people that have lost their hearing, they have heard something. So they still make sounds when they're talking, but they can't hear the sounds. And so it's all mumbled. And so this man is mumbling and he can't hear and he can't speak. And our Lord heals him. But it's in this lesson then, when he's healed, now they say he does this by witchcraft. That's how he's freed this man. And then our Lord goes into the famous episode of saying that if I do this by Beelzebub, if I do this by the demonic, then the kingdom of the demonic is already divided. And house against house will fall in its division. So your argument makes no sense. You want me to be demonic, then you say by the demonic I do what is good. This is the context in which our Lord says that he who is not with me is against me. It's important to understand the context, which was I would say even blasphemously used by Bush at the beginning of the 2000s over the wars in Iraq and after 9-11 when we were going to expurgate all evil from the face of the earth, which of course was already a blasphemous statement also. It is important as Catholics that we understand the context of where these teachings are coming from. And when our Lord is saying, he who is not with me is against me, he's saying, I come to bring life and to teach and to illuminate. When you fight against me because of your illusions, you are necessarily in opposition to that grace that has been given to you to learn. So he who is not with me, the Messiah, the teacher of all the nations, then you're in opposition to me. 
And this will only finish badly. This is not a statement of arrogance. It's a statement of therapy. Your physician could say the same thing. You don't follow my prescriptions, you will die. If you do not do these treatments, you will die. You can freely choose not to do the treatments, not to take your meds or do your exercises or whatever it is, your PT. You can choose to do that, but you will cripple yourself and you will die, or both. And so when our Lord says this, it's actually a voice of the desire to bring healing in these conflicts that they've had in both of these situations. So hopefully now you understand the gospel that's read today. Our Lord is not trying to just go along to get along. But our Lord is not going to fight where fighting serves no purpose. There's no reason to have a clash with the Pharisees who are totally misreading the situation. We can apply this to the whole conundrum of the pro-life movement. We have the same problems. When we stand and yell at each other in Augusta, which is, I'm very happy to see the number of people who defend life in Augusta, but the problem that we have is that no one on the opposite side of that hallway thinks they're evil. They think they're doing good things and helping women and helping even babies ultimately by killing babies. Of course, it makes no sense. But unless we actually understand where we're coming from and what we're actually trying to do, because if you ask both sides of those hallways, they're all going to say we would want the optimal health care for everyone in the state of Maine. They'll all say that. They'll all say we would like to have conditions for the flourishing of human life to the very best degree possible in Maine. Both sides of the hallway are going to say that. The problem that we have is, what is human life? What is human flourishing? And what does medical care actually mean? That's where the arguments are about. The babies and the, and the abortions are just the evil effects of distorted minds, of misunderstanding these essential questions. So it's an application in the modern world of what our Lord is doing in this chapter 12. It's pivotal between the two episodes in the synagogue and the healing of the man who is not by accident deaf and mute. He cannot hear and therefore he cannot speak, which of course in the gospel means he cannot hear the voice of God and so what praises he could possibly give are all mumbled and mutilated. The man himself is an example of the distortion of the mind of the people around our Lord. And unfortunately, to some degree, each of our lives as we go through life, that we have to work through this illumination of a clarity of self-knowledge of what we're doing and of the desire to know what God is doing in our lives. So that in the end, what our prayers have to be each day is to stand before the merciful one, to ask really two fundamental questions. One is to know myself in the divine light. And the second is to ask for God to speak and to show me in my life what I am meant to be doing. Ultimately, that will end in the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. So read chapter 11 and chapter 12 of St. Luke in the fullness and come to appreciate the beauty of the patience, the long suffering of God in our regard. So many times we live in these illusions and we get upset with God's providence. God is not wrong, but we live in an illusion. The Pharisees are not evil in the synagogue that day, but what they desire to do in their misunderstanding and their illusion is evil. We sin so often because we desire the wrong things for all the right reasons. And so we live in illusion and deceive ourselves. We have to pray that God reveal himself to us day after day and that in that divine light we come to know who we are. As I always explain in the confessional, we say how many times we have sinned, not because God needs to know this, 
but because we need to know this. To come into confession after a year and a half and say, I lie, well, that's a good start. But do I lie once in the year and a half? Have I li or do I lie six times in an hour? That's a big difference. Again, God and the priest don't need to know that. But it's part of the sacrament because it is part of the wisdom that comes in the sacrament of penance. That bring us a self-knowledge so that we will be freed from the possibility of walking the desperate path that the Pharisees walked and finished the things in their lives in such a bad way for all the right intentions. So before the merciful one, we ask for that grace to know his will, to understand, to ask for teaching, and to know ourselves before that divine light of the merciful one. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Thou receive these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude. Be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. St. John Chrysostom on page 876. 876. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you, to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give a greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith, which is peace. Peace. O Lord, on high, hidden from all creation, you are peace, reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin, and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace receive our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom, through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you are adored by all, angels, 
heavens bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you. With purity and holiness, may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Father, in the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming. He died from the Holy Virgin and the Red Woman for a God. He took the form of a slave, and yet truly he is the Son of your Majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb, that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother, so that through his grace we may become your children and dares. He took for us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us, for he is your only Son. Kurie eleison. Wabiyamo haudoktum hashodi leima bed chayem. And some el hamobeda kori shanto o barahu kodesh. Walk so yam bintalimita koro mara. Sabahula mehne kulhun. Hono denita fahro. Hamro <laughs> Barahu Kadesh, Uyabin Talmita Karomara, Sabishtawa Mehne Kulhun, Hono Denita, Dumahu Dila Diati Kihadato, Dahlo Faikun, Wahlav Sagiem. Te shadu me tihab, who saw ya, how me wa hoye dan khailam alamin. Do this in memory of me, each time you eat this bread and drink this cup. You remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O word of 
God who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, a lover of all people, that the sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity, in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father saying, sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them we praise you we bless you we adore you we pray that you send upon us we glorify you we profess our faith in you and we ask you have compassion on us and love us have your only son have mercy on us and hear us how awesome is this moment oh my beloved for the living Holy Spirit to send and rest upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin monio, manin monio, manin monio, nite moro rojo chayu kodisho, onachen velainu alu korbono ono. Christ our God, be for us a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. That the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. mercy when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls. Grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishar of Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully. With justice and with holiness, may they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. 
we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, and for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Saint John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious Saint Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who please you and profess your name. We pray to you, O Lord. the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world. Grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in all sign in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. O Lord, you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you we glory forever. O Lord, our Lord, you sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity, and he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy, so that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations, 
the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el Kulifunna. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake in him and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. In the grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us give. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit. Blessed be the name. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you, to you be glory. Again and again, we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. O compassionate, merciful Lord. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these, your gifts and graces, and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed, and your kingdom is holy, and we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo ilukuluchunna. O God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So as a reminder, there is coffee and donuts being provided to you gratis by the Legion of Mary after the Mass, after both Masses, in fact, today, to kind of give a punctuation in the midst of our summer when we miss our muffins. And so by all means, take advantage of the hospitality. It's drier in the basement than it is outside. And it's lovely to see you on this blessed day. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.